Hey team, you're about to experience my interview with Chris Hopper from Forward Agency. He is the co-founder of Forward, and Forward Agency is a YouTube ads specialist agency. They help with paid and performance ads across YouTube, and it's a suite of products, and they have been specializing in this forever. And we had a deep and fantastic conversation about what we believe is the overlooking of the power of YouTube by many B2B brands. We talked a lot about YouTube ads more generally as well across D2C and B2C, but we really, really dug deep on why we think it is that B2B brands are missing a trick with YouTube ads and how they can rectify that and how they can leverage this super powerful channel to help grow their B2B e-commerce business. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to B2B Commerce Corner. Commerce Corner is a sub-series of the e-commerce edge podcast discussing all things B2B commerce through the lens of agencies, consultants, merchants, and more. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Chris Hoppe from Forward Agency. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Jason. Thank you for having me. May, it is awesome to have you along for the ride today. We've been connected online, I think, for at least two years now, maybe even a little bit longer. We've, we've been in a few groups together, agency groups where we're sharing ideas, trying to support each other, trying to help each other through Slack and other channels. And you have gone through both, an, I think, a quite an interesting evolution, both as a specialist in your space, both in the way that you have built your agency, uh, really been super successful in promoting yourself as a subject matter expert, putting out your own content. It's been a pretty incredible journey to watch till now. Thanks. Yeah, it's been interesting. I've been working on in agencies on the client side and started my own agency. So it's uh, many different views. <laughs> you've worn a lot of different hats. Yeah. And look, you, you called it out. Exactly. Like you've been in this space for a hell of a long time. You were senior performance marketing consultant for iProspect and you were head of online. Then a C you've been a CMO, both full-time and fractional for other brands. And now you've got Forward Agency. You've been running that for over two years now, co-founder in the agency. And really, as I understand it, and look, we've had a few discussions, but as I understand it, you really have doubled down on YouTube. You have really started to focus on this performance-based YouTube ads, but instead of just managing the media part, now you manage the, the content and creative, you manage the strategy, you manage the insights and analytics, you manage, you basically can do it all on behalf of brands when it comes to YouTube, right? Yeah, it's interesting. It's probably a neglected or overlooked uh, channel for many. We uh, focus on YouTube because there was a necessity. Two years ago when uh, Iris updates hit, a lot of businesses were just looking for alternatives to Facebook and, and meta ads. And that's when we started uh, working on it. And I think you also mentioned it's specifically for uh, products that need to be explained that are of higher ticket size. YouTube can be a very interesting channel. So also for B2B, it's a very interesting channel. And some say it's the best channel for B2B. I can tell you right now that for me and my business, and I'm B2B, I'm pure B2B, and I really would like to double click on the B2B piece because I think you're right. I think most B2B brands, whether they're selling physical products, e-commerce, whether they're selling services, whatever it might be, I think they're missing a trick when it comes to YouTube because they feel like it's hopeless to a degree. They feel like, okay, YouTube is saturated. How are we going to get any cut through? Can we see any viewership of our videos from an organic perspective? Then when it comes to ads, it feels, oh my God, we're competing with so many other people. The ads are going to cost a fortune. And for me personally, I don't do any paid ads on YouTube. I have historically in the past, but I don't currently. And I would say that although it is hard and it's certainly not as easy to get visibility on YouTube as other channels, the ROI off of YouTube can be astronomical and specifically for shorts at least yeah. in my experience so far i'm getting anywhere from 10 to 50x the viewership on my shorts as i am on my long form videos and by using something like opus clip or some other short video maker i can automate the production of those clips and all i've got to do is basically seo them and, and upload them and put the proper links in the description etc but I get the sense that it's the number two search engine in the world, YouTube is, after Google. Exactly. So the reality is that they get the exactly. traffic, they get the viewership, everybody's going there to watch everything from yeah. recreational videos to how-to videos to 
product review videos to everything you could imagine. They're leveraging YouTube. I stream YouTube almost every single night to my Chromecast yeah. and watch it on my big screen TV. Yeah. And the reality is that YouTube, yeah. I think, is perhaps overlooked because building a channel that can scale on YouTube is hard. It's very hard. If your primary business yeah, is not it's... being a media channel, then you really need to either have a massive focus and investment on that channel or you need help. You need a partner. You need an agency to give you a hand. Yeah. And especially an agency that understands yeah. the algo, understands how to optimize for the channel, and understands how to run efficient ads against that channel. Man, that is a skill set that most brands just do not have in-house. They might have a media buyer in-house. They might have a meta specialist in-house. They might even have a Google ad specialist in-house, but very rarely do they have a YouTube specialist in-house. Yeah, YouTube is very different than other channels also, but there's a lot of powerful elements on, on YouTube. You have the possibility to still have long form content, right? Which is different. You have 90%, 95% have sound on. You have the opportunity to really get a lot of information and value in a video, in a long form video, you can supplement it with shorts, but you can also put a lot into videos. If you run ads, you really need to structure the ads properly. And there, there are differences to other channels. So I see a lot of brands that think, okay, I can just take my TV commercial or my Facebook ad or whatever, put it on YouTube and it will work and it will not work because it's a different platform. It works differently. You can talk about everything, how to structure the creative. One thing you mentioned is interesting because you said it's hard to scale a channel. That's really right. But as mentioned, it's the second largest search engine and the largest search engine is Google. So basically you have the two players combined. And the question is like, how relevant is it, right? If you have highly relevant content, you maybe don't need to scale extraordinary and then have, you can't compare yourself with a YouTube influencer that speaks to mainstream beauty, mainstream fashion or something like this. Maybe you have really a very smaller audience, but you can have very highly targeted content. So it's not only about the masses, but also the relevancy and the trust that you can build on YouTube, right? is enormous with all the content and you can really show your expertise here. And I think it's also really important to have it be part of a broader media play full stop. I think the most successful yeah. product brands in the world, whether they are a manufacturer, a wholesaler, a distributor, a retailer, almost doesn't matter. The reality is they have to see themselves as a media company, at least to a degree. And the reality is yeah. whenever somebody Googles my name now, just Jason Greenwood, for example, I'm all over Google. I'm on every single channel. I'm, I'm on YouTube. I'm on Facebook. I'm on TikTok. I'm everywhere. And then, of course, I've got my own website and I've got my own long form videos. I've got my podcast. I've got everything right. And I think I think that makes it easier for me to meet my potential customers where they are wherever that might be. And if they've seen me or listened to me, say, for example, on the podcast, maybe they've seen me a little bit, maybe even on TikTok video, for example, maybe they've seen me a little bit on Instagram, maybe they've come to my website, and then maybe they've also watched some long -term, long form and maybe even some short YouTube videos, which lead to my long form videos. By that time, yeah. they've had a chance to Oftentimes, it's so funny when I have someone approach me and say, hey, I think you might be able to help me out with this project I'm working on. Let's tee up a call. Then they say, they'll say, I feel like I know you because I've seen some of your videos. I've heard some of your podcasts. Yeah, exactly. I've seen you everywhere. Yeah. I've seen some of your LinkedIn posts. And they go, wow, I've, first of all, you're exactly like you are in your social content. You're the same guy. And so that, that automatically builds an element yeah. of trust. And then secondarily, they, they say, I feel like I know you. I've, I've absorbed yeah. enough of your content that I feel like I know what you're about. And it's that almost constant yeah. exposure across multiple channels that that that, that feels where like the exactly. gold dust of trust is created. 100%. And it takes time, right? It's this demand generation. People get to know you. They start following you more and more, see more and more of your content. And at some point, it's just, I think you also got these messages, right? But the clients say, I've been following you for a while, right? It's not like I've seen your video yesterday or something. It's been like, it's building up over time. So investing in the organic content is something it's very hard because you never know, you don't see the results tomorrow. You have to do it for a really long time. And at some point you're going to harvest, but it's taking time, effort, and you need to trust the process. And of your customer base, if we were to break it down into percentages, roughly what percentage would you say, for example, maybe a retail e-commerce business versus a B2B brand that's either selling products or services, what would be your split today of your customer base? Just as a guess. Yeah, probably 20% B2B or at least customers that also have a significant B2B portion. 
yeah, so it's interesting and you can also take all this, it, no matter if it's products or services. Yeah. I would say what is very special about YouTube is that usually on, on meta ads, you have very short attention spans and very short timeframes, TikTok even shorter. And YouTube, you will have the chance to put a whole landing page, everything that you usually would put on your website, you can put into a video, right? So if you structure it correctly, you really have a lot of potential to explain products that usually you don't understand immediately. You don't see the value immediately and really also target customers specifically with the creative. It's interesting because the intention usually is, especially in the B2C space, you want to grab attention. Actually, the strategy that we focus on is often that you want to make the wrong customers or the people that are not your ideal customer audience, you want to actually skip the ad. So when you run skippable ads, you actually want to filter with the creative already target specific audience. And the algorithm will show your creative more to people that actually are interested in your product. So it's a bit counterintuitive because a lot of the specifically B2C uh, content goes into just want to grab attention, be very also clickbaity. And it's actually quite the opposite to really make it work. And what percentage, first of all, I guess my first question is, do you also help your client with their organic YouTube strategy or strictly with their paid and performance, basically ad-based YouTube strategy? Do you both? You can really uh, supplement the organic strategy very well with ads. One thing that anyone who is listening can already do themselves is just enabling that you build audiences who already engage with your content and push that into Google ads. That's something that you cannot do backwards. And if you start running your channel and building your channel, you will be very sad if you hadn't done that earlier. So I would really recommend that to doing that. And when you do that, what you can do is what you just said is people need multiple touch points. So what you can start doing without necessarily investing a lot of budget, we're speaking about that. $10 a day, right? You can invest into ads that show up in the YouTube uh, feed. So for example, <clears throat> people who already engage with one piece of your content, they might not necessarily see immediately a second piece of content, but you can retarget these customers. And when they scroll through YouTube, you can show them suddenly different videos of your organic videos, right? Of your channel. So the likelihood that they will subscribe and follow you more and see more of your content is much, much higher without investing necessarily now into broad advertising and increasing your top line. So this is really very simple and just helps. It's, I always say it's like putting oil into the fire and making your organic content grow faster. So this is something how you just can hyper grow your YouTube channel, basically. And what percentage of your clients, again, just off the top of your head, do you see not wanting to execute on an organic YouTube strategy of any kind and purely wanting to run an ad campaign on YouTube that then, for example, links out to their website or it links out to a, a landing page or it links out to anything other than another piece of content on YouTube yeah. or it doesn't even cross link to a, a piece of organic content on YouTube. Do you see that being very common or do you see most of your clients running both an organic strategy and a, a paid strategy? Probably I'm a bit biased here because we work mostly with clients that want to grow fast. So they run ads. I would say probably half of them don't have any organic content or not really proper organic content. So they don't have any content strategy for the channel. It works, right? If you really build out the ads the right way, it's also you can test a lot uh, faster. And organic takes a lot of effort. But ideally, of course, you have a combination where you have organic content and you supplement that with ads. And how much effort does it usually take from your team when you're starting to both put together the paid ad strategy, but you're also starting to think about the creative? Obviously, if these brands aren't really used to creating video content, mm -hmm. if they're not used to creating yeah. compelling content, or at least they're not used to testing and iterating to make their content more compelling, yeah. I'm guessing that usually requires a lot more input from your team to give them guidance and pull collateral out of their business so that you can help them create this very attractive, magnetic, ad-based content. Obviously, if you're working with a creator and they're already used to creating some good content, but they don't really know how mm -hmm. to maximize the value of paid ads mm. on YouTube, they might come to you, but yeah. by definition, that means you're going to have a lot more collateral to pull from and work with. And at least like even their tone of voice and their style and all those mm. things, you're going to, you're going to have access to that. But if you're working mm. with a brand that you've never really heard of before or worked with before, and they don't really have a lot of organic mm. content out there, 
I'm guessing that the onboarding process will take significantly longer because you've got to figure out what they're about. You've got to figure out what tone they want to speak with into the market. You want to figure out what their UVPs are. Like, yeah. it, it's just much more effort, right? Depends. I think we need to do that anyway. So if any brand wants to run ads, even we need to do the deep research. And that's reading reviews, seeing what people actually search for on, on Google. And there's a lot of ways how to get into the details. But the more you invest into the research, the better the creative will be, the better the performance will be. So this is really something where you should invest all the effort. In terms of production and yeah, at, at the um, tone of voice, it's actually interesting that you mentioned it because we've done productions for 2,000 and we've done productions for 50,000, which is basically the same script. And uh, interestingly, the productions for 2,000 or is much cheaper, performs much better despite being much cheaper. So necessarily the production doesn't need to be super complicated. And sometimes it's just a creator, right? It's Or even a stock footage with AI voiceover. We have brands that spend several hundred thousand on such creatives and they're still the best performing creatives, while super great detailed production didn't perform as well. So in terms of production, of course, you need to somehow be within the brand guidelines, but a lot can be achieved uh, with very minimal effort. That's good news to hear because, again, I'm not the expert on this. You are, and, yeah. and man, that's why I love to get people like you on the pod because I can't be an expert in everything, and that's why I love to, to bring in subject matter experts like yourself, especially on these areas that I, I see as being massively untapped opportunities because businesses are just – maybe they're intimidated by it. It's almost like I see a lot of brands not wanting to list on Amazon because Amazon feels intimidating. It feels hard to get listed. It feels hard to manage your listings. It feels hard to get your products into FBA. It feels – it's just everything about it, and it feels like they're a threat. It, feel, it feels like Amazon is a terrific threat to most e-commerce businesses, and so they just don't want to touch it because it feels impossible. And it feels like if you do one thing wrong, if you miss a shipment and you know, you've guaranteed second-day delivery and then arrives three days later, then you get whacked way down the list. And I feel – people almost approach YouTube in the same kind of way. They're almost sure. terrified of it to a degree. They don't want to break the rules. They don't want to get there. They don't want to have their channel banned. They don't want to have, they're, they're just really cautious about how they engage with the YouTube as a channel. And yeah. I especially see that reticence in the B2B world. And I'm really trying to orientate this conversation mostly towards those B2B brands, mainly because I, I think most B2C and D2C brands better recognize the channel opportunity that YouTube represents full stop. Whereas in, in, in maybe they're not executing on it and maybe they don't have the budget for it today, but they recognize it and they realize that it's an opportunity. Hmm. But from in the B2B world, especially the B2B e-commerce world, I'm not, well, certainly not a single one of my clients has that I'm aware of has either an organic YouTube strategy nor a paid and performance YouTube strategy. And I don't know why that yeah. is e in the B2B world. They will still usually understand that their clients, even if their B2B clients exist not just on LinkedIn, that they potentially exist on Meta, that they potentially exist on Google searches, et cetera. And so, that, so they feel like those are natural places. If they're going to do digital marketing in it, of any kind, they use those more traditional digital marketing channels. But I feel like the YouTube opportunity is perhaps missed even more by B2B brands than it is by B2C and D2C brands. And your customer split feels like it would validate that, that understanding I have by working with so many B2B brands. Interesting. I guess the biggest issue that I see is that brands try to do that. So businesses try to whatever, can be Amazon, can be YouTube, right? They try something and they don't try it properly. And for YouTube, it's definitely true. So I, the most common issue that I have when speaking with brands, is we tried YouTube ads, it didn't work and we gave up. And then when I ask, what did you try? How did you try it? And immediately understand what the problem is. So this is very, very often. And some brands that really trust the process and, and go through it. And you need to speak with someone who has experience also for Amazon. I have no idea, but it feels the same for me. It's super intimidating if I have no clue about it. And I would super be afraid to do that. So yeah, I think this is really often the issue that you don't try it the right way. And I can just really encourage everyone to look into a channel properly, no matter what it is. YouTube is definitely interesting. Interestingly, for, for B2B, it is the best, much better, much easier than for B2C. B2C has the issue of too lay, low AOV. They have the issue that like it's super, super hard to make a $30 AOV uh, profitable on YouTube ads. It's very, very easy to do that for a $1,000 product or a service that has a lifetime value of uh, 10000 or more. Like Super, super easy to do that. Th there's B2C is actually much, much more difficult to get right on YouTube.
And I think not only do you make the good call out that if I win a B2B basket, then that AOV tend to, tends to be significantly larger than any B2C or D2C equivalent basket. But I think the other thing that a lot of B2B brands forget is we're not trying to win baskets. We're trying to win customers. We're trying to win accounts. Yeah. And the reality is that some, the, the statistics in the B2C and D2C world are staggeringly horrific. That something like 70 to 80% mm. of all of your B2C customers will never return to buy off of your site a second time. So basically, that's why most B2C and D2C brands, when you hit their website, they're trying to create an engaging experience to where you're navigating and they're making suggestions, they're personalizing the experience, they're doing cross sales, they're doing upsells, they're doing all these things because they need to, to maximize the AOV of that yes. first order because there's no guarantee that you're going to get a second one, right? And so you almost have to make the CAC mm -hmm. payback in the B2C, D2C world yes. work in the first order. And that's really difficult to do yes. if you've got a very average, low average AOV. Yes. In the B2B world, because 100%. once a customer becomes a, a customer and they go through the process of creating a B2B buyer's account, they go set up a trade account, they get their price list, they get their catalog that's allocated to them, et cetera, et cetera, that process becomes stickiness in its own right. Because if I've got a supplier mm. of a certain product and I can get a slightly better deal somewhere else, I'm probably not going to go there because I know I'm going to have to go through the account creation process again. It's probably going to take a week to two weeks to get onboarded into yeah. that brand. I'm going to get allocated up. I'm going to have to get you know, allocated a credit limit, et cetera. And so by definition, B2B customers tend to be much more sticky. And so it would feel like the, the CAC payback is almost doesn't, come into yeah. the equation in performance marketing for B2B brands. Yeah, you're probably not going to get an online purchase for, for I don't know, six, seven figures or even, even five figures done, right? Like B2C, you just go and purchase a product for $30 easy. You would not do that for 10,000. You want to speak to someone. So of course, the funnel is different, but that also makes it much, much easier to get actually the trust and to get a conversation or whatever that funnel might be gone on, on YouTube. Yeah, And to me, it makes... On the odd B2B ad that I've seen on YouTube, because I watch a lot of YouTube, the odd B2B ad that I've seen on YouTube, some of them can be super engaging in that you might imagine this B2B brand as a monolith. God, I could never – it's a nameless, faceless manufacturer or it's a nameless, faceless wholesaler that, that you feel like I would never be able to engage with these guys. This is a global brand. I don't know. Maybe it's a Caterpillar or it's some massive global brand. But it almost feels like YouTube ads can make those brands feel more human, feel, make them feel more organic, yes. make them feel more natural, make them feel yes. more approachable. And even if it's just something as simple as showing a guy on a factory floor walking through one step of the manufacturing process, or maybe it's the QA testing process at the end, seeing behind the scenes. It always feels that some of yes. those behind the scenes video ads, I'm like, wow, that's how they do that. That's freaking amazing. That is super cool. And then if that leads to a landing page with maybe a full length video and maybe a application form to sign up as a client of, of that uh, brand or that manufacturer, it, it just, it, it, oh, it, it's, it's actually hard for me to articulate exactly what that does to me, but it just makes the brand feel more human. Let's put it that way. Yeah, for sure. For sure, you can back a lot in, into this, as mentioned, into a video, right? You can also have other clients speak, for example, just have a testimonial supercut already in the video. The good thing is that you don't have to click, right? You don't have to leave the channel. If you see the first seconds of the video, you say, okay, I, interesting. I want to learn more. I want to keep watching. You don't have to click and, and go somewhere. You can keep watching the video. And the more you watch after two, three minutes, if you watch a video ad for two, three minutes, you definitely have show a very strong interest. So then when you go to the website, eventually, as you said, you can have either a longer form video or you already have kind of a funnel where you book a, a demo or uh, whatever it is as the first step. So this is very, very powerful and you get a lot. You can make it very, very personal and you have a lot of opportunity to back into this video. Love it. Love it. And I know for me, like when I first started my podcast, which is clearly a, a B2B podcast in the sense that I'm not targeting consumers, I'm yeah. targeting people that typically work in our industry. And when I first started out, it was audio only. And then I decided, man, this, the world is moving more towards video every day. And I was looking at the stats of video yeah. consumption versus audio consumption. Then when Spotify came out with their video podcast and supporting that if you hosted with them then what they started to do is they said if you host with us we'll show that your video podcast but we will also 
take the MP4 that you upload, we'll convert that to an MP3 for audio, and we'll distribute that to the audio-only channels on your behalf so that you only have to produce the, the, the video. So in historically, I'd have to produce the video. I'd have to split out the audio into an MP3. I'd have to keep the MP4 and upload that to the video-only platforms. It was a big shag around. It was a massive process. Now I produce just the video version of the podcast, I upload it directly to Spotify. It sends out the audio version, and I can use that same video version that I uploaded to Spotify, both upload to YouTube and to Rumble and to any other video platform. Plus, I've got the full-length video to cut up into shorts for short-form video platforms. So it feels okay. like the default to video is really well and truly underway in the media world. Yeah, long-form video first, so to say, yeah. and you can repurpose it for any other platform. The other way is very difficult if you come from short or audio only, then you're missing. But if you start uh, long form video first, you can repurpose. Hey team, I have a big favor to ask you. Please pause this episode and send the link of this episode to someone you know that you think would enjoy this content. Really appreciate you spreading the word. This is how we grow. We're not a Joe Rogan. We don't have big, massive advertising budgets, but we absolutely want to grow. We want to get the learnings from all of these episodes out to as wide of an audience as possible, and we need your help to do it. Thank you, and now back to your listening. And the other thing I've noticed about YouTube, because it automatically applies, at least for the long-form videos, I don't know if it also does it for the ads. It might. But for the long form videos, it also is, is creating the transcript behind the scenes. And I can use, there's some AI tools yeah. out there that can basically take the transcript from the YouTube video. And all you do is pop, paste in the URL of the yeah. YouTube video. It will grab the transcript and then it will convert it into things like a blog article. And I'm now converting all my long form videos Thanks. from YouTube into blog articles and repurposing them that way. So it feels like YouTube has built in so many video specific features into their platform that you can understand why it's become the de facto video hosting platform of the entire internet. Yeah, that's very smart. You can link from your YouTube video to your blog article. You can implement the YouTube video in the blog article and you have cross-reference. And it's true, like, just consider yourself, right? When I have a question that needs, that is not answered directly in, a, in an article, I go on, on YouTube and find how-to videos. And that's pretty much the place you can learn anything on, on YouTube. There are, there are people that learn all their skill sets basically uh, through YouTube. So you don't need any big courses for that. That's true. That's true. And what if somebody's seriously considering, let's say specifically from the B2B world, I don't know, let's say they're a manufacturer or a distributor of a product, they're a $20 million a year business. They've got, maybe they've got a hundred B2B customers today, but they want to really become dominant in their vertical, in their space. They want to become more well-known. They want to be part of the top of the consideration funnel anytime somebody is searching for their product or brand. Apart from coming and working with someone like you, which I would always advocate working with a professional, especially when you start out, it's almost like learning a sport or it's almost like learning a new instrument yeah. or whatever. Sure, you could probably go and watch some YouTube videos on how to play the guitar, but probably if you go one-on-one -on -one and you have a, a, a teacher, a guitar teacher, you're probably going to learn that a little bit faster than what you would from a YouTube tutorial. And so I always advocate that people, especially when they're trying out a new channel for the first time, that they at least get some guidance from an expert at the start. And even if they ultimately decide to take that skill in-house, at least they're starting off with a good foundation instead of making an absolute self. Like you said, what we don't want is people doing it wrong from day one and it becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy that it doesn't work and then they're turned off to the channel forever, right? Let's yeah. try it with an expert first. Exactly, yeah. Let's see if it actually works. And then let's see if it's worthy of further internal investment beyond that. But if somebody's just considering YouTube for the first time, what are the kind of tips that you would give to someone and say, okay, this is how you can make a bit of a business case. This is, these are the things you should prepare in advance. These are the things you need to start thinking about. Where would you advise a, a B2B brand to start before they've ever run their first ad? Yeah, uh, as you said, focus on doing it right. And it's, we've been this, at the same place, right? I've worked at the D2C brand, built the whole D2C there. And we had to find another channel. We looked at YouTube and we were thinking, okay, we can now go with this course an agency which cost that cost us eighteen thousand just to get the high ticket course to find out how to do it or we can try to replicate it from their free content and stuff and we said no we're just gonna save time and money and we basically went with them and learned a lot and tried to model that and it really saved us because otherwise we would have completely messed it up but 
really get it right. The, the most important is really to to know what you're doing, to structure the video in a way that, that works. So the biggest issue that I see, even brands that we've been working with and they try now to write their own scripts is when I look at the scripts, I immediately see, okay, why they will not perform. So you need to really get the structure of the video right. It's probably the most key for being successful on YouTube. So really getting it right, investing a lot into the research, know how to structure the script, and that's the most important. Anything in the production doesn't really matter. If you have, if you just record a video yourself in front of showing your screen or whatever, browsing through your own website, it still works if, you, if the structure of the video is right. So this, this is the key element. The beautiful thing, because you mentioned it along the customer journey, right? If someone wants to own YouTube and be dominant in their space, it's a very nice expression because what we talked about, YouTube is the second biggest search engine. So it has the data of Google and also the data of YouTube. And you can, first of all, bid on your competitors. So many don't know that, but basically you can bid on your competitors on YouTube without them knowing that. So that means that um, if someone searches for you, maybe have already decided in their head to go with your competitor, you can actually suddenly appear with comparison videos why you are better than your competitor, which is, I think, highly uh, interesting specifically for B2B. Uh, you can compare the benefits, maybe what should what you should be careful with going with this competitor. Suddenly these videos pop up and then you can actually make someone who already considered your competitor go with you. You can also appear already earlier in the decision process, right? Because nobody searches for buy this product now. They already have a, a search history before where they first search about the problem and then maybe they understand, okay, this might be a solution. So then they search more about this solution to learn more about it. So you can really cover the whole uh, process, this, the whole decision-making process from awareness to consideration uh, and then purchase. And that's very, very powerful uh, because you have to search data, which you don't have on other channels. And how important for you and the research you're doing for a client before you ever make the first iteration of creative, how important is keyword research for you in terms of what people are already searching for? in relation to your client or the vertical or category. Yeah. I know obviously when you're running Google ads, keyword research is the, the first place you start and almost the last place you finish. It's yeah. really important. If you're trying to capture existing yeah. demand, you have to know what that demand is and you have to know what it's yeah. for and you have to know the terminology yeah. that people are using. Is it similar with YouTube yeah, exactly. that you're putting in a tremendous amount of keyword search research on there to make sure that it's as targeted as possible? And then also the trigger words that, and also the negative keywords, that you use, you want to exclude people from seeing. Is, is that a big mm. part of the process, quite separate to the creative? Honestly, I'm just going to share the, the secrets, how we do it and how we found it most effective with AI. And nowadays, it's super simple. So basically, you take, best is you go and take the, your customer reviews and the reviews of uh, your competitors, get maybe 100 or so if you can, put them into ChatGPT, let them summarize what are the biggest motivations the biggest objections, etc. Get a list of those and try to also use the words, as you said, the terminology and the words that people use when they describe your product. You might think of your product, of your service, how you think you would describe it, but try to use the customer, the, the terminology and the words that the customers use. And you will immediately understand, okay, this is what customers love about my product, my service. This is what customers love about someone else's service, but these are also maybe the um, objections of what they don't like so much about the competitor. So you can really get this information out. And you can cross-check this, right? If you have that, you can go to Google, just paste the topic there or make it phrased as a question. And then Google will show people also ask for, and then you suddenly have similar questions, which is super powerful in terms of finding more relevant and related searches. So you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to use any tools like a Google Keywords Plan or anything to really do this. This is very simple and it will help you to write better landing pages. It will help you to create organic content because it will give you ideas of what you can use, what you can talk about in your videos. And you can also use that for running ads. Love it. And what? how do you guys make your money? Is it based purely on the effort of creative that you have to put in, or is it based on a percentage of ad spend? Like how, how do you guys structure your pricing model so that I guess most importantly, so the customer feels like you've got a little bit of skin in the game somehow here? Yeah, we have different models with different customers. We went away from charging percentage of ad fee because once it scales and when it works and it becomes very expensive for uh, the customers, <laughs> which is good for us, but I really always focus on long-term. 
but we also give guarantees. Actually, we have a hundred percent money back guarantee if we don't achieve certain results, because we have so much experience in the meantime already that we know immediately when, before we start working with clients, if it's going to work or not. So that's also, we do an audit and very often it also happens where we say, Hey, just don't do YouTube ads at the moment, focus on something else first and then come back. It's too early or it, it doesn't work for your product because yeah, but if we know that it's going to work, then uh, we are pretty sure that it's going to work. And have you ever worked with or have you ever considered working with creators that, for example, just want to bring – like let's say I came to you and I said, look, I want to bring more awareness mm -hmm. to my podcast. Look, I'm not expecting any monetary – like direct monetary result. I'm not selling a widget or anything like that, but I want to grow my listenership, and I want to create ads to help drive yeah. that listenership or at least – it's more top of the funnel, which is about my podcast, and then – Putting it onto someone's consideration list, at least, is what I would be hoping to achieve. Is that something you would say would be ripe as an opportunity for YouTube ads? Or would you say, nah, really, it's better if you've got a physical product to sell? No, it works. It works for content. It works for that as well. We would always focus on performance in, in some way or another. So if it's a upper funnel, basically, in the awareness goals, we don't really believe. I don't really believe in this awareness goals you when you talk to google as for experts they will tell you hey we can do brand lift studies and people will say hey i recognize your brand 30 percent more than before but the question is always like where's the revenue or where are the followers or whatever it, <laughs> the goal is so listeners whatever focus on that just because listeners exactly exactly listeners followers download subscribers calls booked so this is what we always focus on that works if you say okay this this is my target but the, the problem with this is basically that if you don't have a monetization behind the question, how much would you pay for a subscriber? So if you are a B2B business again, and you have a very high ticket, then you can pay $50 for a call. If it's a very qualified customer lead prospect, you probably could even pay 300 or 500. It depends on your ticket and your, yeah, in the end, how much you can convert. But for B2C business, it's very tough, right? To pay $50 for a customer even it's because it's not going to be profitable. So again, if you have a monetization or if you have a high ticket where it's worth it, it's much, much easier. So subscribers, followers can work if you really say, okay, I know I can in the long term monetize it through my own consulting, for example. But yeah, you have to do the math on that. Or it might be ads. I might be saying, look, if I can get to a, a thousand or 10,000 listeners an episode, then I can sell this much advertising on the podcast. And this is how much income it could bring exactly. in. And then I can respend that advertising money yeah. on more advertising. So it can almost become a virtuous cycle. If you earn more money off of your content, then you spend more money on your content. And I feel like that's what Mr. Beast has done. He said, look, I'm massively successful, but it also cost me a million bucks to make every video. So I'm putting uh, most of what I'm making back into making more content. Yeah, exactly. So this is very tough. Honestly, I would probably not recommend that to think that you can make more advertising money and this advertising money will pay for running ads. If that were true, then everyone would do it. The, the math we've done it, that doesn't work. So I think you have to have additional monetization. If you run have a newsletter, YouTube channel, whatever, then you have to have kind of either consulting or a, a high ticket or low ticket digital product, anything where you can monetize just from ad revenue, unfortunately, not going to be profitable. Makes sense. And how much, if you're willing to share, how much of forward agencies revenue originates from YouTube ads? To be true, we haven't started with YouTube ads because yeah, we haven't fully scaled. In, in that regard, I know that this is on our, our list for this year, so to be very transparent, but we've run it for other digital products. We've run it for basically our own businesses, just not for forward agency, because I think in terms of clients, we are a quite, I would say, still boutique agency. So we're not someone who wants to work with uh, 200 clients and we would not be able to handle that at the current uh, step. So we've run it for others, other businesses of us, but not for the agency. And I guess you can always turn the ads on and off. So I guess if you were super successful with your ads, then you maybe run them for a week, load yourself up on clients and turn them back off again. Yeah. What's exciting is the opportunity for you to eat your own dog food and use yourself as your own guinea pig. I feel like that's a cool opportunity. Yeah, definitely. We've spent uh, several six figures a month for our brands that we work with. And I think, yeah, we've seen the success, but there's definitely always uh, more to come. Love it. Love it. And I know you target very heavily the B2C and D2C space because that's where people understand, probably understand the model the best is in the B2C, D2C world. But do you have any intention or any plan to better target the B2B physical product, B2B space? Because as you say, 
they're probably a little bit more tolerant of the cost structures associated with YouTube ads versus some B2C and D2C brands that are selling relatively low ticket items. Is there anything in on your radar that you're saying, nah, I actually think we should probably start targeting this B2B space more, probably because not only will our customers make more, but probably will make more at the same time, and probably with a little bit less stress and better, fatter margins, not ra these razor thin margins of B2C, D2C. What, what is your thinking going forward about attacking the B2B space? Yeah, it's a good point. We've thought about it also too, that B2B is a very good market. I think in the B2C space, we also work with brands that are already at the larger size. So um, I think the margins and um, as an agency is very good also in the B2C space if you just work with brands where it makes sense. And I would also not recommend on the B2C side to work with smaller smaller brands. I think if we were to start running our own YouTube ads, we would definitely focus the B2B space, mostly probably coaching consulting. This is something that we've actually done and that that works really well. It's just very much the same. Everyone has their own own services, but that's something that works. Everyone knows also the ads where maybe, it's, maybe a 16 year old wants to sell you how to make $30,000 a day and then shows their Lamborghini and their villa in Thailand. But the, the reason why there are a lot of those ads are because these ads just work. And that's another proof why B2B is, is a very good audience. I, th I think why we are mostly in B2C is because my background is more in B2C than in B2B, but I'm very open to explore more the, the B2B market. I'm here to help you understand it, my brother. So <laughs> listen, this has been a, that's, that's my bag. So I'm always happy to share. Listen, mate, this has been a fa fabulous conversation, really fascinating conversation for me. Maybe all come to you and maybe we'll work together on, I've always done the YouTube thing organic. So maybe it's time for me to try out some, some paid ads on YouTube and maybe you can use me as a B2B guinea pig. But listen, mate, what, what's on your radar in terms of maybe an expansion of services or over the next 12 months? What is agency land is so tough. I know because I've helped build and run agencies. It can be mm. absolutely dog eat dog in the agency space and margins and client services is always challenging because you're dealing with people every day. And it's just a hard, like the agency space is just a hard game to be in. But if you were to look ahead 12, 18 months, how do you envisage your agency needing to adapt or change or add new services to, to keep and, and stay relevant and up to speed with where the market is headed? Or is there anything from YouTube that's coming down the pipe that you're aware of that, hey, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be one of the early adopters of X because we think it's going to work really well for our clients? What's in the future for forward agency? Yeah, good point. Very good questions. Maybe regarding the trends, because that's probably most interesting also for any listeners. What we've seen is a lot of third-party content. That is means that brands are not only advertising as brands anymore, but a lot of brands also build their own media, so to say. It can be B2B, it can be B2C. So basically, it is really important, exactly as you said, Jason, in the beginning, build your own media presence, right? Build your own media powerhouse or, or whatever, however you want to call it. And a lot of them are also, brands are starting that. And the, the reason for that is that it's just more authentic, right? If you sell your own product and promote your own product, who is going to believe you? If you do it as a third party, as a magazine, as a publisher, that seems more authentic. And that's something that we see in YouTube. That's something we see also in, in paid search. And it's also something that we are actually working on and we'll be launching in the next weeks, our own in parallel to forward agency, really also a media platform. I can already say it's going to be forward thinking. So this is something where we say, okay, we're going to take content and this is something that can coexist also to the agency. So it's something that I would definitely recommend everyone to do, to create your own publisher media powerhouse to, to work on content. Exactly as you said, I think there's so much opportunity here and it's just going to get stronger in 2024. And otherwise, yeah, it's tough times for many businesses. It's been very tough, right? The funding has decreased, I think, 95%. I read in, in Crunchbase article, uh, a lot of B2C businesses, but I guess also B2B had the challenge that they were not profitable anymore and there was no funding available. So there was either a lot of dilution happening. Basically, investors got very good deals or some businesses went out of the market. And yeah, it's probably still going to be tough year this year for many businesses. For B2C with lower AOVs, it's very hard to be profitable on first purchase suddenly because everyone talked about, hey, you can just invest and don't worry if you acquire customers at a loss, everything will be fine and that has changed. So this is a tough market to navigate. But I also believe that's a good uh, time because it cleans out all the weak players and it creates again opportunities uh, to grow for the strong ones. So just stay in the game and uh, yeah, build a strong base. 
if you can survive versus all your other contemporaries, I think that when the market starts to look back up again, you're just in the pole position. I can speak only for myself and yeah. our business did 25% more, roughly 25% more business in 2023 than 2022. We had to work harder for it. We had to put out more content to, as a magnet to get people to come and know about the services yeah. that we offered. So yeah. whilst we did more business and we were still equally profitable doing it in 2023 as 2022, the reality is that definitely we found and I found personally that the market was significantly noisier in 2023 than 2022 because everybody was out there yeah. trying to drum up business, beating the bushes. They were, yeah. everybody was trying so hard to win clients and stay alive yes. that to get cut through, even especially in the media landscape in 2023 was just so yeah. difficult. The LinkedIn algorithm just hurt us so bad. Changes to that algorithm and the number of people going mm -hmm. on to LinkedIn. So I like I can back up exactly what you say is that, you know, we didn't want to just survive in 2023. We wanted to thrive. And I think we've made some progress in doing that. And I think 2024 is going to be even mm. substantially just going by this first part of the year, the demand and the amount of inquiries we're getting has just gone through the roof in the first part of 2024. It's crazy. I don't even know where all Congrats. these people came from. But and so I think 2024 is going to be even better than 2023. I think that the media landscape, just generally speaking, is getting and it just feels gut. Mm. My gut feel is it's getting more competitive. And so I would say my recommendation for anybody out there is if you've been considering both an organic and or a paid YouTube strategy, there's, they say about trees, right? The best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The second best time is today. I feel like it's exactly the same thing with media, right? If you're going to do media and you're going to do it well, then sure, it would have been better if you just yeah. started your media brand five or 10 years ago, but the second best time is right now. And as you've said, the competition is so fierce in the media space that we're seeing a lot of businesses simply say, we can't afford it. It's not worth it to us. We're dropping out. We're going out of business. We're going to not compete in this space, whatever. And that's, that in itself is mm. opening up opportunities. That's true. That's true. And I, I, I don't remember how you called it, but there is, for example, LinkedIn as a business platform. How did you say it's an attention seeking love fest where everyone just wants attention, right? And it's very, very hard to, and everyone presents themselves in the best light. And many people probably felt, okay, it was a great platform for many years, but it can change in an instant. So it's always better to build on multiple platforms in terms of content. And as you mentioned, you can make content in the right way, repurpose it across platforms and start building and harvest them in the next years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, as we come down to the end of our time together, I always like to flip the script and hand the microphone over to my guest. Let them ask me one question, any question they like, it can be personal or professional. So Chris Hoppe from Ford Agency, what is your question for me today? I would love to hear one question I've, I've had for a long time is actually to turn it around and say, hey, there are a lot of B2C businesses that are not really considering B2B when should they consider it and what tip would you give to them? Fantastic question. I would say that if you're either a manufacturer, a distributor, or a wholesaler, B2B is great to consider literally any time. I would say if you're just a traditional retailer and you're just selling other people's stuff, then B2B is probably not a great option for you because they can go to the suppliers and go to the manufacturers. They get it at the same wholesale rates as you. But if you have a D2C brand that maybe also does B2C, meaning you, you manufacture and sell some of your own products D2C or exclusively, or you manufacture and, and sell certain products, but you have range extensions that you effectively are the distributor for other people's products, then I feel like those brands are prime candidates for establishing a B2B channel. Because regardless, so, so let's say you're a D2C brand and let's, I don't know, let's say you're a $50 million a year D2C brand. You're manufacturing your own stuff and you're selling them to the end consumer. The reality is that no matter how much money you spend on paid media, on organic, on, on social, on influencers, doesn't matter how much you spend, there are certain customers that you will never, ever be able to get in front of, either because they don't buy online, and we know that between 70 and 80% yeah. of all retail spend is through physical retail. So either, either you're not able to get those customers because you don't have a physical retail D2C store, or you're, there are certain markets where you just simply cannot be present because the cost is too high or you don't know, you don't know how to break into those markets and there are entrenched retailers in those spaces 
that have certain catchments of customers that they can access that, and maybe even loyal customers to their retail brand that you will never be able to get in front of no matter how much time or energy you put into it. And I feel like that B2B opportunity, it, it achieves multiple things. One, it can help you achieve much better manufacturing or wholesale economies of scale. You're able to then, because when you're yeah. selling D to C, you can only sell one, two, three yeah. units at a time. When you're selling B2B, now you're selling cartons, pallets, and containers. That's a totally different value prop. Yeah. And, and the reality is that scale on the B2B side tends to become much more predictable than your D to C revenues. D to C revenues can be massively variable from month to month, year to year, right? And CAC can be massively yeah. variable month to month, year to year, and situation to situation. Whereas in the B2B space, because your customers tend to be much more sticky and much more consistent in terms of their forward buying, et cetera, that becomes a much more predict. Yes, it's typically lower margin because you're selling at wholesale pricing, but you also don't have the massively high co uh, cost of customer acquisition. So you effectively are reallocating from the D2C side of the business, you're reallocating the CAC to the lower margin of the B2B side of the business. That's effectively, you're trading one set of margin for the other is effectively what you're doing. And so I, I would say for most, B2B is a fantastic option if you take it seriously. And by that is that to be able to be successful in B2B selling, it's almost a completely different skill set to B2C, D2C. If you're massively successful in the D2C space, do not think that you can immediately become successful in B2B just because you turn on a 100%. B2B website. Yes, like yes. The, the whole entire exactly. uh, business model is different. And the way that you have to engage with those customers mm. is different. The type of data you have to have is different. The type of systems you have to have are different. And, and so I, I don't want to say it's easy. I don't want to make it sound like it's easy because that would be ridiculous. But I would say that for most manufacturing or wholesale brands, that, that have that opportunity to go from maybe D to C today, but adding a B2B channel with a view to say, I always tell mm. D to C brands, if you stand up a B2B site today, it would be a reasonable expectation to get to maybe 25% of total revenue being B2B within 24 months. So I, I think that's a very wow. reasonable e expectation. Some brands do it faster, but I, that is a very reasonable mm. expectation. If you've got if you've got even a half decent product, if you've got even a half decent range, and even if you do a half decent good job of selling B2B, you should be able to replace or in an accretive way make 25% of your total mm. revenues B2B in 24 months. That's really what you should be able to do. And so I, th I think it's a massive opportunity. I think it's just too overlooked because I think unfortunately Crazy. B2B e-commerce doesn't get the press. D2C e-commerce gets the press, yeah. but we have seen so many D2C brands go out of business in the last 24 months. It is insane. Even the D2C poster children yes. of the COVID era, yeah. yep. we look at all birds. They're about yes. ready to go out of business. That's the reality. Yeah. Without more funding, they will yeah. go out of business, 100%. and they are like a D2C yeah. poster child. And so I think that the, the, the D2C hype has well and truly – the shine has come off these D2C brands yeah. because money ain't free yeah. anymore. And these D2C brands grew up during exactly. free money era. So I think they're yes. going to have to focus exactly. on B2B. That's my, exactly. that's my expectation. Wow. Such an interesting uh, answer. I, I think we need to have a follow-up conversation on that. That's super interesting to hear more about it. And I think one aspect to add to that is that it's also a flywheel effect, right? Because if you sell B2B, you're actually getting more customers that will also do word of mouth and referrals and actually they're people behind these businesses that run around with your product and use your product. So it's super, super interesting. And as you said, a very interesting uh, topic for D2C brands. Love it. And if people want to get a hold of you, mate, I'll put the link to your LinkedIn profile and to your agency website in the show notes. But if people want to reach out to you, how do you like Thanks. people to talk to you more? Yeah, LinkedIn is perfect, but any channel works. I'm pretty much on any channel. So LinkedIn is perfect, but anything Fantastic. And do you want me to put out the, e you, what, what's your email address? People can email you, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, sure. It's uh, Chris at Forward Agency and uh, yeah, otherwise LinkedIn, anything. Love it. Love it. Chris, it's been fabulous speaking with you today. I super appreciate it. I'm glad we run in the same circles. You're a super cool guy. I know that you've got that, you've got that awesome German sensibility where you just, you're an absolute straight shooter. You wear your heart on your sleeve. And I so love that about you. So really appreciate your time today. And I wish you every success Thanks with Ford. And I can't wait to speak to you again soon. Are you a B2B or D2C e-commerce merchant? Then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to learn how we can help you scale your business.